you very much. Appreciate it, you guys having me here. Um, it's actually kind of fun because I've been to a lot of these events in the past, and there's very little on the um, typically on the grounds side of the track. So I'm excited to be able to talk a little bit about what we're doing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, time-saving hacks, especially I'm sure many of you have the same issues we have, where you've got major staffing shortages. So when I first arrived. Here in 2013, we were just barely starting to come out of that recession, so we had a lot of employees um, that had been here for numerous years. Um, we were completely fully staffed, and we had 35 employees, and then in the summer times, we were able to ramp up three to five people during the summer to help out as well. Those numbers were derived from the APA standards for the amount of acreage that we took care of then. We've since added acreage um, quite a bit, actually, over five, 600 acres. Um, we have not added the additional employees. In fact, right now we're operating at about 30 to 40% of what we have budgeted. So we've had to get, obviously, pretty creative about what we do. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that and how we're overcoming some of those difficulties. Uh, when I came here in 2013, I really took this job as a passion physician, um, took a major pay cut from where I was at before and what I was doing previously. Um, but I enjoyed the opportunity where my predecessor before Will got here, he wanted to turn this campus into a botanical garden. Um, I knew Chuck um, Habeck, who was in that position before, by reputation when I was in South Florida. Um, I was a member of Fairchild's Botanical Garden. He had worked there. I had several of my employees that worked for me that also had worked for Chuck. Um, so about 2017, 2018, when he retired, he kind of gave up a couple years prior to retiring on the botanical garden. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but when Will came on board, it was like, oh no, I didn't take this pay cut not to make this happen. <laughs> so uh, Will got on board. Um, we had made sure that it was um, those goals were put into our 30-year master plan. So they are part of our 2020 to 2030 master plan. So we are actually officially a botanical garden, but we have not done our grand huge splash in um, just yet. We plan on doing that this year to coincide with our 50-year anniversary. So we're really excited about that. We have a couple little details left to go. I finally got approval on our actual sign prototypes that will actually be our garden ID sign. So there's a lot involved with making this happen, we've had to do some renovations to some of our gardens, all while being short-staffed. Um, and then, you know, and, and pay. Pay is very difficult. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but we're, um, up until two years ago, we were only at 9.06 an hour. We're now at like 10.50 entry level. It's, it's pretty tough. So um, with that, let's go to how we're hap and making this happen. Why isn't it going? Forward. Clicker was working. We tested it. You mind just hitting the button for me? <laughs> it's one of those bobcats for you, man. <laughs> Should be. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about garden principles. So basically what we've done is we've basically have adopted 100% um, Florida friendly landscaping. Everybody in here understand Florida land, uh, friendly landscaping? Okay. So that's, there's nine principles. It used to be zero scaping, which was not zero scaping. Um, and that also meant that you could use hydric areas, water areas, et cetera. Um, that was seven principles. There's now nine. So we basically have adopted those principles, and we are working on reducing stormwater runoff, uh, reducing our mowing. That's not one of them, but that's a byproduct of that. Um, protecting our waterfront, right plant, right place, attracting wildlife, um, fertilizing appropriately, reducing our fertilizer needs, pest control needs, pest management, um, and doing that responsibly, as well as mulch, recycling our yard waste, which we weren't doing, we've started doing that. That's a tough one with um, staff, and we'll talk about that. And then watering efficiently. So to reduce stormwater uh, runoff and mowing, when I first got on campus in 2013, within the first couple of weeks that I was here, I noticed that we had numerous ponds, and the majority of our pond banks were not designed 
Um, one to four is ideal. One to three is tolerable. Two to one, one to one, those are just flat out dangerous. And I'm seeing our staff on these banks that are pretty, pretty steep. When I was in Clearwater, I actually had a gentleman who lost the back of his foot to a lawn mowing accident. He had only been with us about two, three months. He was instructed not to mow this particular site until the dew had dried in the morning. He wanted to get after it and get done. He went ahead and proceeded, and there was a three to one, borderline two to one slope. The mower, because the ground was wet, the weight of the mower slid down the embankment. He put his foot out to try and brace against the building and ended up losing the back half of his foot. So, and I was the first one on site, no fun. Um, so to avoid those kinds of issues, um, one of the very first things I did is I set about getting a whole bunch of native plants and started planting with the help of um, our university students and volunteers. Um, and we started planting link banks. We planted 13. So what that did is that reduced our mowing space, right? It created a much safer um, environment for our staff. We didn't have to keep fishing people out. We can go to the next one, sorry. We didn't have to keep fishing our mowers out, which was a common occurrence, especially with a couple of employees that aren't with us anymore. They've since retired, so they'll rename them nameless. I'll save them the, the embarrassment there. Um, but that was that's a common occurrence, That was or was a common occurrence. So that was just, we had to take care of that. Um, we also were, um, with the planting of the banks, we were able to improve our soil stability. Um, increase wildlife habitat. And then those banks, we started out with five or six natives. And then the banks naturally filled in on their own. And then this was also a learning curve for the general public because all of a sudden we went from having mowed retention ponds that are neat and tidy to, oh, okay, well, it was first plan. That's not so bad. And then you have to adapt as birds and other animals start to have their droppings. That in turn turns into a a tree seed or windblown seeds, and next thing you know, you've got pines and maples growing up, and you're creating this really great ecosystem that's great for plant health, wildlife, uh, cooling, but it also starts transforming the overall look. So then you have to worry about how the general public is going to accept that naturalized space and get them used to it. So by starting out so with a small amount instead of heavily planting, that kind of helped to do the job for us because the, you slowly start getting used to it, right? So we have over 13 ponds that have been planted. We plan on planting more. Um, the other um, advantages to it, go to the next one, are going to be curb appeal. So there's some pond banks I can't plant the whole thing because they're in campus core. For example, in this illustration here, we planted a section of it. But then we have another section on the back side that's part of our student union. And anybody joining me tomorrow for my tour, you'll get to see some of this. Well, that has to stay a little bit more tidy, if you will, for now. Um, but we get great curb appeal with it, right? It improves the aesthetics. We are able to reduce mowing with it. Um, by the way, the cannas, when they come up later, they're not now. But those are edible in case anybody's interested in knowing that. They taste like endive. It's really tasty. Um, and then we end up with pickerel weed. Um, some, these were actually transplanted by themselves. We didn't plant the pickerel weed nor the um, scarlet hibiscus. And then where you can see the algae here. This pond still gets mowed a little bit. So what ends up happening is those grass clippings end up getting into the pond. They silt the pond in they end up creating algae bloom because of the release of nitrogen. So that's another advantage to when we start getting the entire bank planted that we can start reducing those algae blooms. I don't have to have that pond treated on the, uh, the ponds that are heavily planted. Those don't have to be treated anymore. Um, now we did have recently uh, one of our ponds that was tidied up a little bit for us and they did a good job. They meant to do the right thing, but now all of a sudden we change the aesthetic. And it's like, okay, fear. People are going to want more tidy, right? But that's more work. We need to reduce our work, right? By so planting this too, that's a lot less work. Nature's doing its thing. And they left the clippings, which was good because we're trying to reduce the amount of clippings we're leaving 
um, and leaving them in place. That way we're not spending our time and energy going to the dump. So where our facility is located, we're just off the of campus now. We used to be in the campus core. It takes us a solid 15 minutes to get from our building into the campus core with our golf carts and mowers. Um, and that doesn't count like getting out to here. You can plan on that easy 20 minutes when students are here and it's busy, 30. Um, if you get here faster than that, um, you're probably running students down. We don't want to do that um, as it gets pretty congested. So those are issues that we have. So we're trying to reduce those times. Well, our dump site is actually up by about five minutes from our shop. So you can imagine all the trips to the dump, every time we're taking um, clippings and we're taking them up to the dump, we're spending all that energy, we're spending our fuel, um, time, resources that we really don't have if we can leave it in place. The problem was is when we left the clippings in place on that case, we had all the decaying underbrush turned into massive amounts of nitrogen loads into that pond. The entire pond became filled with algae. Then we had to actually have that pond treated. Um, fortunately, we already have a contract to get that taken care of. One of the things we plan on doing in the future is also doing floating wetland islands. Those will act as habitats. We're going to use uh, predominantly, it is not a native, but vetiver grass. Vetiver grass is the number one erosion um, control grass in the, well, actually plant in the entire world. It can produce roots up to 100 feet, grows both in a, uh, a water as well as on soil. It's used for perfumes. It's edible. Um, it takes up huge amounts of um, heavy metals and other um, nutrient loads. Um, great job at filtering. So what we plan on doing with it, and it's also um, been studied, the variety that we're using has been studied by the University of Georgia, by Dr. Hanna for over 25 years, 100% sterile. So we don't have to worry about it impacting our preserve. So we are going to put those on mats. Um, originally, it was said that we needed 20% coverage, that it was reduced to um, 10. Now they're saying a 5% coverage on our ponds, like out in here, will do the trick for helping us to pull out nutrient loads. It also helps us with the silting in. And then what we can do is we can fish those mats in, take, cut the roots off, um, use the roots and use that for composting. By the way, our dump, when I say dump, it's actually a green. It's 100% compost dump site, um, and then we can push it back out. And then if we plant the remaining balance of some of those ponds, that will also help us out with that. And that'll help us with filtering our water um, and, and making sure that when our water is coming from stormwater, right now all of our roads on campus, it goes right into the slough and the preserve. So this way we're filtering it before we're dumping it straight in, right? So, and that's part of a huge watershed here in Jacksonville. Um, another quick fact, in, when I got here in 2013, we were, Jacksonville had less than 2% of our native forest remaining. So you can imagine that our campus and our preserve, it's less than um, 1% and the bulk of it's right here. So um, we'll talk a little bit, bit more about it on the tour if you join me on how we're creating uh, wildlife corridors and what we're doing on intercampus with our built environment and how it's echoing the preserve and teaching the general public how they can create wildlife corridors because we need to do more of that. All right, so aesthetically. Um, the other thing that we've been doing is we've been getting rid of all of our little, what I call chops, little tiny little spaces for mowing. Is anybody here that hates having to go in and do a little tiny little island, got a little three, four, five patch? It's just stupid. Right, you know, and then you've got all the utilities in there. You've got light poles. You've got your trash receptacles and all of that. So, we're strategically removing them. You have to do a little bit at a time, um, and we're being very careful about our selections on that. And we're also reducing our mowing on inner campus core because we have a very tight window. We arrive at 6:30 in the morning, and we've got to be out by about 8 8:30. So if I've got mowers in there and I've got noise in classes, it's a problem for us. So fortunately, the campus is kind of set up. Anybody's been here to Savannah? 
Savannah is set up in squares, Charleston, the cities, the way they were designed. So our campus kind of has these courtyard squares. So almost all of the turf in those squares has been removed, you know, slowly and methodically. But we have to do it carefully because every time you remove that turf, you end up with weed seeds, and then you've got to make sure that you've got your soil sterilized. I don't want to have a problem with um, not just my uh, mostly um, St. Augustine, but we have a huge problem with um, Bermuda and um, goosegrass and all the other weeds in addition to spurge and everything else. So we try and sterilize that soil as long as possible. So if we do small segments, we can get away with that area being kind of naked and ugly without the bosses complaining too much. But if we do a big area, then we get problems. Then they want us to go plant it right away, which is the worst thing we can do because we haven't had a chance to address that seed bank, right? So we've got to make sure that we're trying to, even though we educate the bosses, we're trying to like, no, we need to wait. <laughs> you know, we need to do it right. And we're also trying to reduce the amount of chemicals we're putting in our soil because then if we keep treating with Roundup, and I don't, I'm not an advocate against Roundup, it has its place for sure, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but the problem is, is it kills all of our beneficials as well as all the nasty bugs, right? So then the next thing you know, we don't have soil anymore, we have dirt. Um, so soil needs to have all those microbes, it needs to have mycorrhizae, um, the good bacteria, uh, fungi. So we're trying to reduce the amount of chemical loads while still addressing, <coughs> I'm sorry, is somebody able to get me like a little bit of water, please? <coughs> and Anyways, and still keep good plant health and healthy soil. Um, because if our plants are performing um, poorly, then we're going to have a problem with weeds. They're going to outperform. Um, we do try and plant in a little dense. And so some of the things we're doing here is this is actually a section on campus. This is our little woodland forest. And what I'm showing you here is that we've used a plethora of different ground covers. And we've intermixed them. So we've kind of are trying to recreate the forest. So it started out that this garden had the majority of Algerian ivy. But the problem was in case of extreme droughts, we'd have scale. It would die back. It would be sparse. Next thing you know, I've got weeds popping up. And that didn't look very attractive. So we started adding, um, there's a, actually a Florida native um, African um, violet, but this particular one is Australian. It's really pretty, the native one works too. Problem is it's not as readily available. So this little pretty thing here gives us some little pops of color, it fills in. When the ivy doesn't uh, perform well, it does great. When the ivy starts to perform better, it dies back, but you still get bits and pieces. So there's kind of like, um, if anybody does permaculture and does actual gardening for crops, it's kind of like having cover crops and they're all working together and each one's like, you know, we have nitrogen fixers in there, so one's feeding the other, so we don't have to fertilize anything. Um, we're keeping really good plant health. We also have, I don't know if you can see it very well, but we've got some spider lilies in here. This one's really fun. This is our um, tropical oak leaf ivy. It um, was actually sprayed out accidentally by one of our spray techs about six, seven years ago that thought it was um, poison oak. It's just now starting to make a resurgence and coming back, fortunately, because that was a hard one to get. Um, so we've got like this whole like kind of menagerie. When you get to it, if you come with me tomorrow, you'll see it's actually really quite lovely. It's really pretty. Um, and that's a way to help with that. Um, we do occasionally have to pull the ivy off of the um, columns. But most of those columns are um, planted with um, creeping fig, and we'll talk about that in a second. Next one. Thank you. So I was talking about little chops, stupid small areas that we had to mow, where it's like really, you know, getting our right on mower in there, crossing all the sidewalks and everything. Um, that actually used to be much steeper. They raised the drain. Um, but it's like, why are we going to go in there and mow that little area? Usually it ends up with, you know, weed whacker just to get it done, right? Well, somebody else is doing something else. And then you got a lot of edging. So to avoid that, we ended up removing 
the turf that was in here and we planted uh, frog fruit, the native frog fruit. So you can see where we planted here and then this is what it looks like a few months later. Right now it's semi-dormant, but it makes a really nice little carpet and then we only go in and mow it a couple times a year. Um, it's also really great for um, wildlife. It has little flowers, it's got little pollinators. It's almost like matchweed as far as the flower size. It's a great little um, ground cover. It can also be uh, mixed with other natives. So if you didn't want to do just frog fruit, you can mix it with sensitive mimosa. Um, it works and plays nice with it. It also plays nice with um, perennial peanut. And that also, when you have more ground covers or even turf, they're doing studies. Um, University of Florida has shown that if you mix your turfs, they're showing like St. Augustine, for example, if you do four different types of cultivar of St. Augustine together instead of one monoculture, it actually performs better. And then you don't need to water it as often. I don't know about anybody about, uh, here, but at my house, I turn on my irrigation and I have um, almost an acre, less than 10 times a year. Usually I don't get past the first hand on how many times I turn on my irrigation. Um, and that's with St. Augustine. And what I've gotten it done is I've taught my grass to not be a chia pet and not be reliant on everyday water, right? So when we keep watering and watering and watering, all we do is we're creating lazy grass, lazy plants, right? They are, hey, you're giving me everything I need. You know, they like, it's like, same thing with fertilizers. Um, if we keep giving them uh, chemical fertilizers, they get lazy too, okay? They, it's like crack for them. They're waiting for that next fix. And then they start jonesing on you, and then the leaf blades start to fold, they get crunchy because they're not going deep down, and they show that sign of stress within a day or two. But if you slowly wean your plants off of that and you select the right plants, you can really reduce your water um, consumption and you can have healthier plants. But that study shows that by that mixed culture that it actually creates a better um, relationship within the root zones with fungi, buck, um, bacteria, et cetera. So you, that those plants end up performing better for you, um, for your turf. So, next one. And then here's another example of perennial peanut mixed with sensitive mimosa. I do have to do a little shout out and a little uh, caveat here. Not all peanuts the same. Certified only. Do not buy anything that is not certified. The certified growers, it's weed free. It's make sure it's rhizomal right, because half of the growers out there are giving you golden glory or non-rhizomal, and those perform poorly, or they're giving you hay. So you need to make sure that you're getting the right cultivars. My two favorite is the standard EcoTurf, certified EcoTurf, or Cowboy is a new one. We'll go to the next one. You can see this is really pretty, because sensitive mimosa doesn't hold up as great as I would like it to when we had just all beds by itself only. We end up having a real problem with um, weed competition. So we mix the two. Um, they also help, before I go to that next one, um, they also help because they're nitrogen fixers. Where I had trees that were underperforming, and not only was it in turf areas, but raised beds as well. Where I had my trees were performing poor, they're in um, landlocked, in you know, like a giant tree pit, if you will. So they needed more fertilizer. They had tapped out the resources in the soil. So these plants are helping with that. Um, so they're, now the trees are performing better. Um, then we'll talk about we're creating no-mo zones. So part of that was with the stormwater um, retention and systems with reducing the mowing. We're going to start in other places, start reducing 10 feet. The state soon is going to be implementing. It hasn't been done yet but they're really going towards no mow within 10 feet of any water body, right? That way the clippings and that I've been talking about, nutrient loads, algae blooms, all of that is reduced significantly <coughs> by that 10 feet. That way that shoot's not getting out there. Because sometimes you try to mow and have it shooting away from the water. There's just, you know, sometimes there's just no other path. You don't have a choice, even though you want to change directions whenever you can. Um, but we'll be starting to create more no-mo zones. Um, and then we can do in those 
wildflower areas as well. And then you can also reduce your frequencies. So um, UFIFIS has also done some studies recently that show that the average public doesn't know the difference between if you were mowing every two weeks, like say you're behaving on roadsides, if you waited three to four weeks. Once you get to six weeks, then they start to get a little grumpy about it unless it's like a wildflower zone, but you can actually cut down your services. You can kind of test the waters a little bit. Um, so that's another helpful tip. Um, and then edging. So you know, most of our guys like to mow straight or edge straight. If you just put a little bit of a bevel on it, you can cheat for another week or two, right? So that you're only edging every couple services. That's another way to help you out if they're not already doing that. Um, and then um, we should treat our precipitation as a resource and not as a waste byproduct. Um, we, you know, when we're in a drought, if we do some of the things we're gonna, uh, we're doing on campus and we start doing more of it, we'll have less of a water problem. Right now, the majority of our campus core is on reclamation water. Um, out here at UC Center, we're on potable water. It's a lot of acreage to be on potable water, so um, we don't water as frequently just to help to um, mitigate how much we're using. We've also lowered the services here just a tad. It used to be at a level five, so we're now at like a level three. Um, try and keep the front doors as best as possible. Of course, forgive us this time of year. We've got cold damage going on. Um, but we try not to trim things too early because then they won't come back and then we got to spend money to replace them. So we're trying to get people used to, like if you come from up north, you're used to seeing you know, sticks and dead plants that are perennial and then let them come back. So we're, again, we're trying to train that audience for that so that we're not having to go out and replace all the time and spending all that energy and consumption. So one of our projects that's um, actually in the works right now, this is under construction where we're going to um, take before this particular bank, this is a bioswell. This actually slope was pretty heavy duty right here off of this building. You get a ton of sheet flow off of the building when it's raining. So the surface of that, um, the building acts like the surface on the ground. It collects as much water and drains down, and it's draining straight into this catch basin here. The road around here on the side on UNF Loop also pitches like this, right? So everything was converging and going straight to our stormwater system, and then that drain goes straight to the slough and the preserve. So what we're doing now is we're reducing mowing, we're reducing our grass space. So this is going to take up just under an acre. Um, we have excavated this space here all the way down the road. We just actually expanded it a little bit because we just figured we could get a little bit more um, water treatment. So what we did in this cross section is where the drain was, the grass was flush to it, everything pitched to the drain. We ended up excavating about 18 inches below the drain. Then we came back and added super coarse um, sand filter fabric, and then gravel. And then that layer is below the storm drain now. And it's about four inches. The other area, the sand and the gravel is got big, huge macro pores. So it collects. This whole theory space here acts like a bathtub. It's a basin, but it's got nice contours to it. So the idea is that the water flows in when we've had these rains. We had, I don't know what the count is after this week, but over the weekend we had on pretty close to four inches, we're 3.87. Um, so we're holding it in there, it drains and perks into our water table um, within two to three days. It's filtering through perennial peanut um, and then we'll be planting it as well. We'll be using native plants, so this is a great way to display it. We'll have some decorative rocks. Um, so it'll be an attractive feature, brings in wildlife, reduces our need to go in and maintain it. This ideally um, should end up only requiring us to go in and tidy it twice a year. So not too bad. And we're taking up a ton of acreage, right? Kind of taking it off of our plate, so to speak, while we're servicing, our, uh, filtering our stormwater and recharging our groundwater and not overtaxing our systems. 
So that's, I think, is a really great way to go. I plan on doing more of this with rain gardens because we have lots of storm drains everywhere. And the rain garden is similar. It's just not going to have as many pitches as this has where we create that bathtub kind of um, space. And again, I reference um, IFAS a lot, but they're a, great, a wonderful resource. Um, they've also did studies on bioswells, and they've found that when they're just planted, um, the public finds them unattractive and very messy. So you've got to add your gravel. You've got to add your boulders. You've got to make it look like a really cool dry riverbed to sell the public on it, right? So um, in fact, I can, we can attest to, this was originally planted with just blue flag iris and um, coreopsis because it was a little bit of a swale and the bosses all hated it. It always looked mo messy. So we end up mowing it down before the plants could actually do their jobs as far as acting as pollinators, et cetera. So we're excited about this project. And then right plant, right place. So in this case, believe it or not, with that sh staffing shortages, we're actually adding gardens besides the ones they're giving us. So they added two new roads. So we have new roadways that are actually, fortunately, under contract management. We're able to contract a couple sites out, but we can't contract everything out. And the contractors are having the same problems we have, so they're not delivering on the contracts, right? We're getting really poor service from that, so that's not necessarily the solution either. Um, but we're taking, again, more grass out of service. So in this particular instance here, what I'm showing you is where this space up top, I don't think the laser's gonna work for me. Yeah, ah, it is, yay! Okay, so this space up here um, was over 6,000 square feet of turf. It's located in the courtyard. This is um, the courtyard here, the Brooks College of Health. And what we end up doing is removing that turf and we put in, as part of the botanical garden, a healing garden. This garden before was, it had great bones and structure, but the plants that they planted originally about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, were getting leggy. They're at the end of their life cycle. The trees matured. Um, the Indian hawthorn that were in full sun are now in dense shade. Um, so we needed to kind of give it a facelift. And then as a botanical garden, we also needed to give it a purpose, a sense of purpose. So it made sense to make this a, a healing garden since it um, sits and nestles into our Brooks College of Health, which is one of our flagship programs. And then we also started MedNexus with um, Dr. Seismansky. Um, think of UNF Health and Shans for doctors, but for nurses. So um, what we ended up, whoops, now it wants to work. Jeez. Okay. Um, so anyway, so we removed that, but we did it strategically. Okay. So it looks like it's a big space and a lot to take care of, but all of this is paving in, ah, dang it. Okay. Button. All of this right here is gravel and it's permeable. So this in here is a labyrinth. So I took up a lot of real estate, not a lot of plants. It's 100% permeable. It's also ADA compliant and it's crushed decomposed gra uh, gravel. It's really great for dog parks and other um, pathways as well. And then we use brick to outline the um, labyrinth. So what we did is we took up a lot of that 3,000 square feet, that labyrinth is um, 28 feet in diameter. Huge chunk of real estate, right? And then we added a perennial edge, which is here, which will be part of the uh, Florida flower field trials for the north um, northeast. Right now it's all in central Florida, so we'll be part of that which is really exciting. It's a partnership with FNGLA as well as the Florida um, Horticult, um, Florida Hort Association. And then inside these little boxes is rose gardens. Um, we selected Easy Care Roses. We're using uh, repeat bloomers. You would think that would be tough, but repeat bloomers and then um, disease resistant, almost all of our um, roses are either on antique old stock or on uh, Fortuniana, so it's a lot hardier. There is tricks to that though. 
um, your Fortuniana, you need to make sure that you don't plant your roses below that graft or it will revert and then you've got a problem. Um, but there's a couple little tricks with it, but it's not too bad. And um, then we also made sure to replenish the soil. So this site, before we went in there, the sod wasn't performing really well. And we go back into old historic aerials and we discover all of this space used to be portables. Guess what happened to the sidewalks and the portable pads? They got covered up. <laughs> they just threw dirt on top. So we ended up, I did not spend the money to excavate where we have the permeable um, paving, but where we did put in the roses, we did replace over um, 60 yards of soil um, and pulled out all the um, concrete, big chunks of concrete, um, and lime rock um, rose base, which is also not good for us for pH, for what we're trying to grow in our region, and we replaced it. So we made sure that we had a really good, healthy planting base. Um, and then by having that clean fill, we had fewer weeds to contend with as well. So we didn't have that same issue that you sometimes have with that weed seed bank, right? So we've had very little issues there. Um, so that's worked out well. And then up in this space up here, that's our bee patch. And we've um, used the riope in here. And then you walk in and mulch is our pathway for there. And I think it looks pretty good. We did some other strategies we'll get to in a minute. We can go to, well, let me see if I can get it up. OK, so then I've talked a little bit already about um, fertilizing, fertilizing responsibly using cover crops if you can. Um, that helps you a lot. It'll save you a lot of time. We were, we had zero spray techs for a very long time. We got really lucky. Um, and we, over the it's course of six months, we end up with two spray techs. We have five position openings for spray techs. So, <clears throat> yeah, but our two are really, really good. Um, so that's helping us out a lot. They're not doing a lot of fertilizing, though. The majority of what they're doing is um, pre-ams, pre and post-emergence. Got to love our snapshot, freehand. <laughs> yeah, those are, that's what we end up doing. But again, the more, the healthier we keep our plants, the better it is for us and less work we have to do. And then there's fewer inputs that are required. We're not having to replace plants as frequently. And then we're also using, this is before applying it, but we use a lot of creeping fig to help to soften our ugly, brutalistic buildings. So the campus was designed, we're celebrating our 50 year anniversary. The campus was conceived in 68, it opened in 72. So that was right at the peak of the brutalistic style. Um, and so a lot of our new buildings kind of echo that a little bit to blend, which is okay. But we soften them up. So we use a ton of creeping fit. The problem is this got really healthy and robust. So having to trim up here along the covered walkway here and keep it down so people can see through it, get the weight off of it because it gets too heavy with the fruit. It peels off that it's unattractive. Um, we've gone to trim tech which is a growth regulator that I adore. Growth regulators from 20 years ago were not worth a penny, in my opinion. We, would, we tried using them at Clearwater all the time for Bougainvillea and Plumbago and uh, Viburnums that get odoratism because, you know, how many you have to deal with them planting odoratism that wants to get 30 feet tall as a foundation plant and they want you to keep it at three feet. So it just doesn't work. Um, but those growth regulators required you to basically have sticks, apply it immediately to even get any functionality out of it. TrimTech, if you're not familiar with it, is actually a two-step uh, process, and you actually trim a couple weeks in advance. You wait until you've got new flush and growth, and then you lock it down. A um, couple things we have learned about it. So, one thing is once it locks down, you might get one or two shoots that come up. We just hand prune those out, and then we lock it down again in another three weeks. Holds it for about a year, um, but what it does is it 
takes this, it's still growing, right? But the cells, instead of the cells being elongated like this, the growing cells, they're really, really, really compacted and compressed. What that also does is it re reduces the amount of water and nutrients that the plants need for uptake. It puts it in that flowering state year round and keeps it looking really good. It also, wherever the product falls when you have an application like this, it also suppresses weeds and growth down here. And right along this edge, though, I'm like going, what's going on with the turf? It looks really funky, man. It's like, what the heck is happening? And then we realized it was actually affecting the turf in a negative way. But they have a product that will neutralize that. <clears throat> so we have to make sure that they neutralize it down here. In the beds over here, I don't care, right? That's, that's an added benefit to me, and it's a bonus. Um, same thing with over at Hicks Hall. We have oh, over three miles of hedges out there that are 20 plus years old. <clears throat> Iliagnus, Viburnum odoratissum. Yeah, loads of fun, right? Cut it, you gotta go cut it again, right? And then trying to keep it at our safety heights. Gotta love the trim tech out there. That saved us so much time. So like, for example, in the creeping fig, we were having to get, um, the scissor a lift in some places out there, um, getting that onto campus, like getting our uh, vehicles onto campus is a nightmare in and of itself. That's one logistic issue. But then we also have to get up on the lifts. You have safety issues with that. And we were trimming these things probably a minimum of six to eight times a year, probably could have trimmed it even more because we did sometimes we would like get a little late, the figs would get heavy and we lose big sections. So now twice a year. <laughs> That's it. And it's one time hard. The other time is just anything that just jumps up. So that's pretty easy. So I highly recommend that product. Um, let's see. Next. And then I mentioned before wildlife corridors. This is an example where we've naturalized an area. We had several trees so and some palmettos. So we've gone in and we've turned this into a butterfly garden and um, we created kind of this natural area. It's, um, we've got nice edges though. What we have discovered, especially in biology, we'll see that tomorrow, is that we had a wildflower, native wildflower garden there that can, when it goes, you know, in wintertime, it can look kind of pretty messy, let's be honest. And it was designed originally, be it was put in before I got here, and it was designed with a couple, two Z, three Z plants here, two or three here, four or five there, then repeat them. And so you'd have like 50 plants, all native flowers, all together. It's just is a hodgepodge mess. Staff can't tell the difference when new plants are emerging with dune sunflower or other plants is can tell if it's weed or not. So what we've been doing is we've been editing those gardens where we're seeing clusters of say our partridge peas and our uh, black-eyed Susan, and we're clustering them together and creating what I call clouds of color. So that way, okay, this is this zone for this native plant, right? If it's not this plant, it doesn't belong, right? That way, I don't have to have my staff know every single plant, and they can go in and maintain it. Be it got to the point where nobody wanted to touch it because they were afraid of, of damaging um, the garden. So now, you know, while we're in this process, you can do no harm. And then all of these gardens are pest control free. Um, so we've gotten away from um, pest control. We use natural fertilizer. So we have a, um, we didn't for a while. We're having a problem with scale because we used to get coffee grounds from uh, Starbucks. I now have a source to get um, coffee with the person who has the contract with Maxwell House here in town. So we get used coffee grounds. So that is a fantastic fertilizer. It also helps us with scale on all of our cycads because we were getting a really big problem with city mold. In fact, if you looked outside, one of the King Segos looks really sad because it didn't get treated for a couple of years with COVID shut down. Our resource for um, coffee grounds went away. We just got this resource just a couple months ago. So it'll take a little while before we start to see really great results. Um, but we started putting coffee grounds back out. Again, fertilizer. And then we also get Zupu. 
with the Jacksonville Zoo, and that's 100% non-smelly. It's great. It's also another great um, natural fertilizer um, for us. It's already composted. Um, so that's something else that we use. And then um, we're also working on our insect populations. So anybody read Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, or any of his other books? No? Write this down or remember it. Commit it to memory. Douglas Tallamy, he's an ophthalmologist, Bringing Nature Home. It will change you. It is life-changing. Um, even if you didn't think you cared about bugs, but you care about landscaping, your whole world will get rocked. 80% of all animal life on the planet is insects. It's that whole food web. We have to keep our soils healthy. We have to keep the worms and our decomposers healthy, right? They help to create healthy roots. They help with the bacteria, the mycorrhizae I'm talking about. Um, and then you've got your next cycle where you've got your birds and or your frogs that are eating those insects, right? And then you've got your animals and it keeps that entire food web going. And it helps us with our pollinators. Pollinators in the state of Florida last year accounted for, for our agricultural crops, over one and a half billion dollars. Well, our numbers just jumped. So in Florida, um, Florida's agriculture was, um, what is it, 15 billion, we're now at 31, I think it is, is what the report just two weeks ago came out. So we've got to keep our pollinators happy because we're seeing a humongous decline. Um, thank you. Um, mulch, I'm going to have to hurry up, right, because I'm almost done. Um, mulch. So I talked about how we leave leaf litter. So in this particular instance, they did the right thing. They left the clippings. But what I would have preferred is when we're trimming the grass down and dethatching it, instead of trimming it with big long strands that we do it in chunks and then disperse it so it reads more like um, pine straw. If that's too ugly for you, you can lightly top dress it. Nothing hurt. There's nothing wrong with that. We've also gone to pine bark. We used to have to do the ugly red mulch for forever. Thank God we're over that. Um, studies have shown pine straw, pine bark are your best mulches anyway. And then leaf litter. So here we didn't quite blow off the rest of this walkway. That's part of that healing garden. But all these leaves are now helping to fertilize, put nutrients back in the soil exactly the nutrients that those particular plants that grow in harmony with those oak trees nearby need. They also, on our bigger leaves, help to shelter our plants that are um, um, begonias and other plants that are kind of borderline annual perennial and where they were able to survive the cold because it kind of acted as a, like a nice little warm blanket. Staff, it was driving staff crazy though. They wanted to rake out the, the sycamore leaves so badly. It was it driving them absolutely nuts. It's like, leave them, leave them. Try it again, getting them used to it not always having to be that perfect carpet, right? And then the public as well. Um, so, oops, back. No, I'm sorry. Um, so, cutting, leaf litter, composting. We do a lot of composting. We do blow in and we've started contracting since we have salary savings for losing so many employees. We do blow in like in places like this and other big locations. We'll get the entire area prepped. We're at several hundreds of yards of, of mulch and we'll go ahead and pay that extra to have it blown in. It just makes sense. Um, and then we're reducing um, our turf and then we're enlarging those beds. We keep adding beds so we're giving like ourselves a couple feet. You know, bed lines walk anyway, right? Kind of it's like a pet peeve of mine when they get all squiggly squaggly. So we're starting to clean those up, increasing that bed line, increasing that mulch, uh, mulch border. That buys us a little bit of time so if they don't edge and we get runners, it doesn't look quite so bad and it's easier to maintain it and not lose it. Um, and then, again, healing garden. So in, whoops, I keep doing that, sorry. Um, we also, in underneath tree canopies, where we can't grow turf, we're mulching. This was, of course, back with ugly mulch. Um, but we've added fake boulders so that these big, huge mulch beds don't look out of place and kind of boring until we can plant smaller plants. So we do do plugs so we don't have root suckers. 
because nothing's worse than going in. You got a big, huge oak, and you go and plant underneath it. And next thing you know, all you have is a bed of root suckers. Well, we don't want to do that. That's counterproductive. So, in some places, we put in the fake boulders. Those boulders act as seats. I don't have to worry about ADA compliance with it. And then in this case here, we've added hammocks. This is a whole bunch of um, crepe myrtles that were mature. Those will root sucker just as bad as an oak. We did some inner plantings here, but this is an area that we actually invite them to come in and submerge themselves into nature. And at the same time, I have very few plants to take care of. So we strategically put in the hammocks strategically gave them a place for mental and physical well-being. It's been proven that your blood pressure will drop um, tenfold within 10 minutes of going into the garden versus absorbing it from the edge. So we got we killed a lot of birds with one stone, if you will. Um, and then we also have a volunteer crew program. So a um, year and a half ago, I contacted the Extension Service, got a bunch of master gardeners, it, it took a little while in the beginning. They didn't get credit for coming to work for us, but because I provide, every time they come out, an educational component, they get their CEU credits. So if you wanted to start a program like that, the way to entice that qualified workforce is to work with your extension service, give them the hours, give them beds, kind of where they adopt a bed. So in this case, the volunteers, and there's a lot more of them, I'm up to 50. It started out with six um, that answered my call within 12 hours in the middle of the pandemic in October of 2020. Um, so we're doing really great with this program. We also put this sign out so that when they are working in the gardens, they have volunteer shirts that the public also asks them questions that also fills that requirement. So that is a possibility as well. It's a, um, they're highly skilled. The other thing is they also have tree stewards. So these tree stewards are now helping us with subordinate pruning. If um, I'm going to run out of time, you want to talk to me later about subordinate pruning and a subordinate pruning program so that you can train your trees from babies to having the proper lift and, and everything. Um, I worked with Ed Gilman years ago. We could do that. Um, and then I think last one. And then the last thing, and I know i got to wrap it up, um, we also work with our local um, special needs programs. So around the corner from us, we have a program called Alden Road. Um, they have two programs, CBVE and then Project Search. In a nutshell, CBVE is where the job coaches come out. We train the job coach. The job coach works with the kids with the different needs. They could be autistic. They could have um, hearing uh, sight deficiencies, um, a plethora. Most of them are very high functioning, though, that we get. The job coach with CBBE stays with them the entire time. I don't have to babysit, okay? They come out. I give them an area. That's the area that they manage and take care of. The kids love it. They're happy. They're excited. They're productive. They don't mind repetitive tasks. They're really great with... Um, weeding and all of those things. You can also do them for cleaning. We have a cleaning group as well. And then we have hired three so far. So we have Dylan, who just onboarded with us last um, week. David, who's been with us four years. And Emily, has been with us for two. Um, and then there's Project Search. That's the next step up. And they come. they have a job coach, but the job coach is on site, but not with them. They actually report to our supervisors. So they're treated like any other employee. And it's free labor. And they love coming to work for us. And that's all I have. I think. Because I'm done. <laughs>